PlayStation brought with it a serious amount of solid fighting games, and with the likes of the Tekken series and Street Fighter to contend with, it was inevitable that some of them would fall through the cracks and never really reach the mainstream audience. Evil Zone was one of them that hugely differs from other fighting games on the system, mainly due to the fact that it only requires the use of two buttons, one being attack and the other being a block. I know it may sound completely stupid on the surface, but this setup packs a serious amount of depth once you get used to it, as each attack is not only influenced by the distance between fighters, but the directional button you press at the same time as well. This leads to a fair amount of moves that each character can perform, so it's a good idea to try them all out to settle into a fighter that suits your style of play best. Some of them focus on defensive options, such as large blasts that can keep the enemy at bay, to the more up-close and personal characters that thrive using ground grapples and various techniques. Combos are out of the question though, and it's up to you to link your limited number of attacks and hammer at the opponent until you can get in there and take them out. Now one aspect I love is the camera that focuses on the action. Every character can temporarily trap the opponent within an energy field and slam them with a cool look of attack. What helps these attacks look so good is the camera work. Once you pull it off, you see the attack from a different perspective, and you get a new view every time you do. This helps keep the limited moves fresh, and lends a certain amount of cinematic flair to each fight you find yourself in. Overall, when it comes to fighters on the PlayStation 1, Evil Zone is by no means the best, but it's one that wasn't afraid to try something new, and as a result presents an experience like no other. If you're a fan of the genre, this one will not disappoint. Now one of the best things to come out of Square during the PlayStation era was not only their various RPGs, but their brief exploration of other genres. Experiments like Bushido Blade and Chocobo Racing were met with little success, and unfortunately the same fate fell upon Iron Hander. While at its core it's no different from the classic 2D side-scrolling shooters of old, the 3D graphics of Iron Hander are excellent on both a technical and artistic level. The robotic enemies you'll be up against have plenty of style, from the little police drums, complete with sirens and light bars, to the hulking mech bosses bursting with weaponry. 3D graphics aside, the basic idea of Iron Hander is the same as it's been ever since classic shooters like Gradius on the NES. Fly left to right, struggling to survive against the onslaught of enemy forces, and destroying as many of them as possible. But the game's biggest mechanic is its namesake. Iron Hander means one-handed in German, and this is your primary means of acquiring new weapons throughout the game. Your ship packs a manipulating art that can grab an enemy's weapon so it can be used yourself. Usually, the enemy will need to be disabled rather than utterly destroyed for you to cannibalize its weapon, so it's a must to attack the cores of the larger enemies rather than trying to knock off every section of their armor. A combination of quick tactical wits and long-term strategy is necessary in deciding which weapons to take of which to let flow by. Taking the weak ones will help you against small enemies, but something with a little more punch like the grenades are absolutely necessary against bosses. It's clear that Square didn't just recycle a bunch of ideas when it comes to Iron Hander. They jumped straight into the fray and applied their accumulated knowledge to a then new take on a popular genre, making it one of the most challenging, replayable, visually pleasing experiences on the PlayStation 1. Saga Frontier 2 is by far one of the most unique RPGs that ever landed on the PlayStation 1. The basis of the game is very different from most RPGs in almost every sense, in that there is no world map, somewhat non-linear gameplay, no experience or typical stats you would usually find, and the game spans 80 years with two different storylines that do not feed off each other at all. This may have the potential to turn some players away, but that would be a huge mistake as even though it's clearly different, Saga Frontier 2 is about one of the best adventures you'll find on the console. As I mentioned, there are two different storylines, with one following a young boy known as Gustav, who's part of the royal family and gets cast out of its reign. The other sees you filling the role of Will, whose family have been searching for an item for many generations that holds a deadly power. Each of them are both as intriguing, but I found Gustav's journey to be the best. Now as with any RPG, its story could be incredible, but if it doesn't have a solid gameplay foundation, it doesn't mean fair. Thankfully, Saga Frontier 2 truly shines in this department, and offers up two separate types of battle, duel and party. Duel is a match between one character and one enemy, and party sees up to four of your characters engage in the fight. Party is without a doubt the best type of battle, as it allows you to earn special abilities for any weapon you currently have equipped, and is the main way to grow your proficiency when it comes to dealing with enemies. Now the most striking feature about the game are its visuals. 
that take on a sort of hand-painted watercolor aesthetic. All of the characters are nicely animated, and the sheer amount of polish that has gone into everything, and the way each attack plays out, to the slick and smooth transitions, it's all nicely done. If you're looking for a new RPG to jump into on the PlayStation 1, Cyber Frontier 2 is a great option. The Ridge Racer games have always been some of my favourite racers, ever since being introduced to it in the arcades. It eventually made its way to the PlayStation 1 and would go on to spawn several sequels with Rage Racer taking the usual formula the game was known for and flipping it on its head by providing a much more home-centric approach to its setup. This is most prominent when it comes to the progression in the game that allowed the player to unlock several cars but more importantly parts that could be used to upgrade each of them. It's all broken up into a series of championships, with each of them consisting of several races in order to win. Making your way through each provides a meaningful challenge, with several special events being safe for players who go the extra mile and complete everything the game has to offer. Now when it comes to gameplay, the tried and tested formula of the series is in full swing, with a huge emphasis upon drifting in each race. It's nothing like the feeling of successfully drifting through several turns as the announcer adds you on, and with the ease of the controls it opens the game up to players of all skill levels. Now visually, Rage Racer could be seen as a bit of a mixed bag, and that's mainly due to its colour palette. The previous games in the series were well known for their vibrant appearance, which no doubt played a huge role in attracting players in the arcades. But with Rage Racer, there's a clear effort to make things a little bit more realistic, which results in a rather dull impression. I for one actually loved the visual style though, and saw it as a huge stepping stone to what we later got with Ridge Racer Type 4. On the whole, Rage Racer is one hell of a racing game that deserves a spot in your collection. From its generous amount of replay value to its rocking soundtrack, it's a game that will not disappoint, so if you see it on the cheap, do not hesitate to pick it up. The PlayStation was home to some great beat em ups, but one that never gained the recognition it deserved was Panzer Bandit. It depicts a world where natural resources are running scarce, with an evil corporation hoarding what little is left. As one of the heroes, it is your job to infiltrate their compounds and retrieve this material that's represented by small diamonds that scatter each level. Now, the game is split up into about 10 areas, with each of the stages ending with a boss. As the player, you get to choose from four characters who each possess their own special attributes. May that be faster speed or the ability to deal more amounts of damage, each of them have their pros and cons. The basic gameplay is all beholden to two gauges first being your health obviously, and the second dictating your ability to perform special attacks. As well as this, you've got a standard weak and heavy attack that can be used to string combos together, which helps build your special gauge, and keeping it topped up is vital, as the onslaught of enemies just never lets up. Of course, you've got a few defensive maneuvers as well, with the main one being able to switch between what plane you are on in each level. It's free in total, you need to time it perfectly to escape and not just end up in the path of another enemy. One of the first things you've no doubt noticed is the incredible sprite work that makes up the visual style of the game. Each of the characters are intricately designed and perfectly fit the look and feel of the world the developers created. This goes for the, this goes for the stages themselves as well, which offer a broad amount of environments to make your way through. Unfortunately, there is a bit of slowdown that occurs when the action really heats up in spots, but it's frankly nothing that ruins the gameplay on the whole, so if you're looking for an action-packed beat-em-up on the PlayStation 1, look no further than Panzer Band. Bows and Arms is considered to be one of the most innovative RPGs on the PlayStation 1, mainly due to the interesting ways the game is set up and how the systems it presents play into one another. The story thrusts you into a role of a spirit blacksmith, Mayus, who is a descendant of an important family. He and his companions are revolting against an emperor and is searching for five holy flames. With this power, you'll be able to rule the world, and this is where Mayus comes in to stop them dead in their tracks. As with many RPGs, the adventure is broken broken up into several areas, all connected by a world map. You'll find yourself visiting towns and villages to forests and mountain trails as the journey unfolds. Just as important as the story and the world is the gameplay itself, which truly comes into its own during battle. It's turn-based in nature and sees you carrying out a vast array of moves and abilities, 
but the most prominent being elemental beasts. These can be summoned after reaching certain conditions to provide much of the visual flair during each encounter. But the most unique aspect of the game is the dating mechanic that allows you to date several of the female NPCs. By going on dates and interacting with them, you have the opportunity to increase your intimacy level with them. Each of them has a mood meter, and depending on your actions during your time together, their mood will affect the outcome. This plays nicely into weapon and spell forging, which is intricately tied to your level of intimacy with any given character. It offers a really engaging way to enhance your abilities without having to solely rely on battles. The PlayStation was a literal powerhouse when it came to RPGs, and although Thousand Arms couldn't be described as one of the best, it's definitely one that does enough things differently to be able to stand on its own amongst its contemporaries like Final Fantasy. If you come across it on the cheap, it is well worth picking up and adding to your collection. Soul of the Samurai sees you taking up the fight as one of two characters. Firstly, there's Kotaru, who specializes in sword combat, and the second is Lin, a ninja who is far more agile than the former. The core of Soul of the Samurai is screen after screen of swift and bloody fighting set pieces. Ninjas and samurais stalk the village streets, dojos and forests, which is countered by dizzying flashes of steel, and then fountains of blood as torn up corpses slump into the dirt. It's an often thrilling game whose ongoing combat sequences create the idea that you are a one-person agent of death in a dangerous world, wordlessly dispatching foe after foe in style. As either character, you will gain many new weapons and abilities to slay the hordes with. A huge part of the gameplay is your magic as well, which is earned alongside the experience points you gain, so there's no tedious items that need to be found in order to use it. Aside from the special abilities, each weapon has different combos that can be pulled off, and you can do a variety of combinations within the system, so the game isn't just a mash one button to win a fit, but rather careful and strategic planning each and every time you engage an enemy. Even with combos and special abilities, though, that does not change the fact that this game is hard. You will die many times in attempts to defeat bosses, and in some cases, even the regular enemies. So taking your time is key. When it comes to replay value, Soul of the Samurai really excels. Due to it having two main characters, you can easily jump back in at completing it with one of them. The best thing about it is that there's key differences between the two campaigns, with a total of three endings to be found. Top this off with a new game plus mode that allows you to keep all of the moves and weapons you may have acquired and start over again. Overall, it's not perfect, but I believe most of its shortcomings are outweighed by what Soul of the Samurai gets right, and that's providing in an unforgettable samurai adventure. Tail Concerto has to be one of the most jolliest games I've ever played. If you're at all a lover of cats and dogs, then the premise alone will bring a smile to your face. The game takes place in a kingdom known as Prairie, which is dominated by masses of floating islands inhabited by dogs and cats that for some reason have a fully working society. The cat gang known as the Black Cats, feeling overpowered by the dogs, have revolted against a system that mostly catered towards their canine enemy. As the player, you take on the role of Waffle, a sort of police dog that pilots a mech suit. The game plays out like an RPG when it comes to its towns where you can talk to people and get clues on where next you're supposed to be heading. The rest of the game is more of an action platformer, where you'll be capturing cats, jumping gaps, and fighting huge bosses all thanks to the abilities of your mech suit. The main one being your suit's arms that can be used to scoop up more than just cats. Enemies will often throw bombs at you, and if you're quick enough, you can throw it straight back to deal a healthy amount of damage. One of the most striking things about the game is its presentation. It reminds me a lot of Mega Man Legends, with its vibrant, cartoonish nature, with each and every character you meet along the way seeing the same attention to detail that brings them all to life. From facial expressions to the slick presentation of cutscenes, it's a great looking game that absolutely gleams with imagination. If there is only one gripe with the game, it has to be that it's over far too quickly. There are no side missions besides collecting red boxes that'll unlock artwork back at Waffle's house. Nevertheless, it's still a solid experience that's worth giving a go, so if you fancy trying out something strange, but ultimately quite wholesome, then Tail Concerto deserves a look. Siphon Filter was one of the biggest hits on the PlayStation 1, so it was a bit of a no-brainer that we'd eventually receive a sequel. It once again sees you taking up the fight as Gabe, but it seems he knows a bit too much and he's being tagged as a fugitive by the government. 
This chase takes you around the globe, and along with it comes many different types of areas for each mission to play out. The design of each of the levels is just incredible. They're not too easy to find your way around, but the confusion that was often found in the previous game has been completely removed. The missions themselves are quite diverse, so the game is never boring. Sometimes it's all out balls to the wall action, and other times you'll have to be sneaking around. You were given various objectives, like eliminating certain people, diffusing some deadly bonds, or some good old fashioned shoot everything that moves. And much like the original, there's a wide range of weaponry. You've got all of the favourites from the old game, plus the inclusion of some beauties like the crossbow and taser, and an assortment of rifles and guns with varying amounts of damage. A big deal was clearly spent on the implementation of the enemy's AI. Compared to the original, each encounter feels far more challenging, so taking advantage of every option you have available is the order of the day. Generally, the graphics of Siphon Filter 2 were pretty close to that of the original. There are a few small improvements though, such as the resolution being higher, resulting in everything appearing a lot sharper and clearer. The game just oozes detail without having too many weaknesses in its armor. Despite its good looks, the frame rate is always slick, and slowdown just doesn't come into the equation. Siphon Filter 2 is by far one of the best games on the PlayStation 1. If you're fond of action shooters and never got round to playing it when it first released, it's never been a better time than now to jump in. Kodalka is an RPG that most people probably haven't heard of. It all revolves around a young woman of the same name who possesses spiritual powers and has the ability to commune with the dead. The adventure kicks off in the late 1800s in my home country of Wales, and sees Koldalka being summoned to a large mysterious monastery that has been long rumoured to be haunted. As you would have guessed, it's not long until it all goes to shit, and you find yourself trying to survive the nightmare that's seemingly tied to this intriguing place. The atmosphere in this game matches that of Silent Hill. It's dark, creepy, and at times extremely violent. Slowly walking through the dank and somber surroundings does nothing but help pull you further into the tension that slowly rises from the moment you start playing. As with most RPGs, you're joined by a party of like-minded individuals which can all be freely customized. You gain points as you level up, and these can be allocated to increase life, magic, strength, and various other attributes. Your weapons and magic can also be leveled up, and you can increase each character's effectiveness by repeatedly using them. Now the battles take place on a grid, where you can place your three characters and then move them forwards towards the enemy. Each move and every attack requires its own animation, which makes the battles quite slow in nature. In fact, the slowness of the battles add to the creepy atmosphere, since the place is imbued with the spirits of those who have died in horrible circumstances, many of the monsters are truly that, monstrous. The design of each enemy is a real standout, and will more than likely turn a few stomachs for those that play it, but if you're fond of survival horrors and RPGs, Koldaka is the perfect mix of both. Well that does it for today's video, keep an eye out for part 2 as that'll be coming up soon, so don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell to get notified about new videos. You can follow me on all of the socials which are linked below to stay up to date, and also join my growing community on Discord to meet many like-minded gamers to continue the conversation with. I'd like to give a special shout out to my Patreon supporters Rhino, Skilljim, Shuden, Richard, Amy, Daniel, Paul, Dio, Omar, Strider, Pierre, Hal, Awesome Jacket Dude, Ryan, Alex, Gamecube Galaxy, Chris Salaryman, and Paddy J for their continued support that helps make these videos possible. If you're interested in joining my Discord or supporting the channel through Patreon, you'll find all of these links down below. As always, thanks for taking the time to watch the video. I'll catch you next time.